son-in-law, Mike, as we're uh, running, jogging, walking fast down a vast shale, whatever it's made of, mountainside. I'm out of breath, but we're trying to keep up tempo. Son-in-law Mike calls back to Kate. Kate, what's the rule? Kate goes, I know. Don't summit afternoon. That's the rule. Here's I have a little video to show you. Just getting out of the car. Where are we? Near Kite Lake? Yes. Kite Lake. And uh, heading on our seven and a half mile trip. go uh, clockwise then from Trailhead Democrat first and we were questioning whether Cameron's real Lincoln. but South Lincoln Ross and that okay hot. Just nine o'clock, which is late to be starting on 14ers. Well, we had an hour and a half drive from home and we just got started a little late. And it uh, seems like it's good weather today, so we shouldn't get blown off later this afternoon. We should be okay. And there's Mike behind me. <laughs> and Kate's stopping to take her outer shell off. It's gorgeous. Glorious here. We're close to a saddle between the peaks. We are flagging. You can notice the lessening of oxygen from when we started. But we're making our way. We've been on the trail an hour and a half. Feels pretty great, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> Go see the full video at either my webpage, donshrum.com. It's also called Faith Biscuits. Or raise your hand if you've ever been on YouTube. You can find anything you ever want on YouTube. Type in Don Shrum. You get my channel where I post all sermon videos and a lot of these little videos of hikes and that kind of stuff too. I want you to know those things for purposes later on. Get adept at finding uh, some things online of what we're doing here at Genesis. Um, it was scary being on top. It was scary when the thunder came in uh, and the lightning, and that's why we were running, and that's why we were chastising ourselves all the way down about the rules. We know the rules, but then you think, I know better than the rules, and it's, nah. We didn't know better than the rules. All right, today, we're continuing in our uh, theme this month of Sabbath, some sabbatical stories, and rest. Last week, we were talking about resurrection because I wanted to start this next chapter of our shared journey together on resurrection and the peculiar way that even the Gospels tie resurrection, even Jesus, to Sabbath rest uh, for you and me there uh, as well. Arguably, the very core of our Christian faith, of our identity, of what we say we believe, what makes us who we are, the Bible ties to the importance of Sabbath, uh, sabbatical. I want to read a little different to you. Turn to Isaiah 58. You got to hear some of this already. Because there's some hard word here about rest as well as good word. Here's my bookmarks for this morning. It's 
the napkin I got from the holidays event last night. It says, I really need a day between Saturday and Sunday. This is, this is for preachers who hang out with their very fun uh, congregations on Saturday nights. Need for rest. 58, I want to show you some things here backing up. Uh, because this is some, I think you might recognize some of these texts. I'm on page 688 of your Red Pew Bible, Isaiah 58, verse 6 I'm going to. I'm talking about the core of faith, and there's some justice issues here, believe it or not. Not just rest, uh, but justice. Listen to this. And this is in contrast to fake spirituality. Here's what God is saying through Isaiah to us. Is not this the fast I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Jesus is going to borrow this when they ask him, what's your ministry about? He's going to be quoting some of these same texts. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them, to not hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth, like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness. Your gloom be like the noonday. Those are some Advent texts. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. You should be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. That's like the psalm. You shall be like a tree planted by a stream. That's how healthy you're going to be following God's rules. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. And then these two texts. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it not, going your own ways, serving your own interests, or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall delight in the Lord, and I'll make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I think we have one other text, right? We'll go right to Exodus. Someone read Exodus 28. You already know what this is going to be. Exodus 20 is the Ten Commandments. Someone go back to page 66. Would you read for us Exodus 20, verse 8? Remember the Sabbath day. Short and sweet, there it is, right in the top ten. So listen, there are rules to follow. There are, there are laws uh, and discipline. If you're going to enjoy life, you're going to stay safe. Even, which is interesting, if you're pursuing beauty. Uh, I thought a lot on my vacation. Uh, I thought a lot of... Priscilla, who gets to walk and always see through the eyes of a photographer, and of Margaret looking through Grant's eyes, uh, of Lori and Jeff. When, when you travel, I didn't know this until recently because Julie got a new lens and we took the camera with us. My trips were changed dramatically looking through her eyes and what she'd take pictures of and where she'd stop and say, how about this? Not the pictures I would take. There is a discipline to good art. You know, you know this already, uh, that if, uh, if you're going to design a building architecture, you'd say, well, you just build what looks nice. And everyone might say that except for an architect would say it, and that is not what you do. There are rules of two-thirds and thirds and beauty aesthetics. The, anyone who's in band, into music, knows this as well. No, it isn't the case that you just sit down and play what sounds good. It is the case that there are rules and regs, there's a law you follow. And when you can follow those laws together, then what is allowed for, what creates is beauty and freedom and something different, um, more than cacophony. Julie has an eye. This is St. Thomas, St. John. Uh, this is our little buddy. He was this long, by the way, if you can tell. 
in Julie's eye, she always looks for beauty in different places because she knows about uh, light, dark, composition, thirds, two-thirds, contrast, uh, composition of how you make up that picture. This, uh, in St. Thomas, we spent half an hour hunting down a wildest noise. We couldn't figure out where it was and going through neighborhoods and we finally came around upon a uh, junior high, senior high equivalent of a marching band, only it's a steel drum band. Inc um, unbelievable energy. Uh, the kids were warming up or horsing around. It was chaos. Uh, so I, we love this, uh, seeing all the, and the, you can't see, he's tucked in here. Um, the director was very tolerant and letting them do the things and only focusing on a couple, but out of that sound, wow. So maybe a little more law when they perform, I suspect. Here's one of the best pictures I've ever seen in my life. Julie didn't just happen to take this picture. It's a real picture. It looks like, to me, it looks like fake. This is it. It's how she composes where she stood with the angles and the lines. One of the most extraordinary pictures I've ever seen. There's a guy we wanted to, he wanted to talk to us, his next door neighbor, and he let Julie take his picture. Barbados. I, we neither of us had ever seen this before. A ring around the sun, a mind blowing. Uh, something about, I don't know, you can tell me the moisture, the, whatever it is. Extraordinary pictures. These, bu these buildings uh, and walking on the beach that we spent a lot of time seeing. Um, and not just casually taking in, but Julie's starting to train my eye as well with those rules and go, oh, I see what makes, what draws my eye in this picture, what makes it a good picture. Turtles, hard to get pictures of turtles. That's me. Our road trip, our road trip to uh, West Coast, 4,000 miles from here out to San, I wanted to show Julie all my old haunts, my seminary in San Francisco and to play around in the city, go up the West Coast of uh, California, see some sites, a friend in Eugene, Oregon, family in Portland, obviously my family in Seattle, my college alma mater, East Washington and Spokane, down to Boise, see a whole previous life and friends and family. Along that way, she was driving an I-90, I was dozing, and suddenly I was aware that rather than going 70 miles an hour, we're getting off the freeway, and I was, hang on, what, what's going on? The answer is, she had seen this barn. You can't tell very well from this picture, there is a little bit of light right through the barn. We, we had to pull off, and I'm, she's leaning out the window, and I'm holding the steering wheel going five miles an hour, and a little further forward, you know, and I'm driving here, and we're on the side of the highway, because just to get this picture, and of course she took 10 or 15 pictures that aren't as good. Um, beautiful picture with an eye for composition. Uh, how the law helps us see. I'm a little reluctant as a boomer to have laws and rules. We're still in some ways our d group of people still fighting the 60s and we, so when, uh, when my kids were little, one of the things I hated hearing most was, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> Fighting in the back seat. You're not the boss of me. And I kept on waiting for the time when either of them would come and say, you're not because never happened, luckily. <laughs>